Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Detention, uh, where we get people from the endurance community, force them to spend time with us after school, and throw spitballs at them. Uh, today, we are super stoked to have uh, an author on the show um, who we recommend to everybody, and we make all of our athletes buy uh, the book that he and his wife wrote. So Simon Marshall is here with us today, uh, the author of The Brave Athlete. And he grew up in Zambia and the United Kingdom and played soccer, rugby, and tennis before he ditched all of those sports <laughs> to take up, uh, you know, a true sport, uh, cycling. Um, <laughs> Uh, he pursued cycling until his educational career in sports science showed him that he probably wouldn't become a professional cyclist. Uh, and so instead, he went out and picked up a lengthy list of degrees, publications, and honors, uh, making him one of the world's experts on exercise science and sports psychology. Simon works beyond sport, though, helping patients with chronic illness lead help happier and healthier lives. He's been invited to speak at both the National Institute of Health and the Center Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, but he maintains that's only because he has a British accent. He runs Braveheart Coaching with his ex-Terra World Champion wife, Leslie Patterson, and two, the two of them wrote one of our most recommended books, as Chris mentioned, The Brave Athlete, Calm the F Down and Rise to the Occasion. Simon Marshall, thank you for joining us in detention. Yay! So happy to be here, Chris and Molly. It's lovely to see you virtually. I can't see you guys in person as we would usually uh, this time of year. And I, I and I need to get my wife to start using that introduction to me on a daily basis. I, I kind of like it. I usually just get you know swearing in Scottish, uh, but I like that. We'll <laughs> send it to you. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, I just have a my I play it play it constantly. But big up the ego, right? <laughs> and then and then tell us how it went afterwards. Yeah, that's right. Not well. I don't need to know how it went. I can tell you. I'll do a pre-mortem, as they say in psychology. Yeah, <laughs> so we're going to start off with the same question we always start off with. Is this your first time in detention? Or were you a child? I, I, I was a pretty nerdy, uh, swatty kid. Uh, I did have a detention a couple times. Um, usually for talking back and uh you know just being a smart ass in class but i wasn't I, you know no, no really like smoking behind a bike shakes or stuff it was usually just being a, a wise ass but uh, a few times but not too bad uh was it called detention in zambia yeah, in the uk it's really <laughs> it was yeah don't we speak english there and we we live in real houses <laughs> and we celebrate christmas can you believe that savages so yeah, so uh, we is it still called detention. Uh, Zambia, I you know came back because there's really not much schooling beyond sort of elementary and middle schooling, and my folks didn't want to send my sister and I myself to boarding school, so we all were shipped back to the UK, and there uh, went to school and grew up uh, the rest of my time there. Um, so the uh, the second question after we get the after we establish the fact that like Chris and Molly were bad kids and the rest of the endurance world was a whole bunch of goody two shoes, um, <laughs> uh, like how how have you been doing this year? This has been a, a really tough year, um, and um, we've been asking people what has this year made room for, um, and uh, you have started a podcast. Um, and we were wondering if that came about uh, because of the pandemic or that was something that simply uh, uh, like arrived in real time as the pandemic took hold. Yeah, it was sort of bad timing or good timing, depending on how you look at it. We actually started planning it. It's the Xterra, the official Xterra podcast hosted by Leslie uh, and myself. We started planning it in sort of uh, October, November around Xterra Worlds. Um, and... Then it just sort of, we banked a couple of episodes and we only released one a month. Uh, and it's been a sort of a year experiment. It's really fun actually, but yeah, we didn't plan on it in any way, shape or form to be responsive to people being locked up, sweaty and permanently naked from the waist down on Zoom. Mm -hmm. uh, it just it just worked out that way. So uh, listen, if I can get a chance to, to talk and uh, interview people and only be half dressed, I'm all in, man. Same. So <laughs> ask, asking for a friend, um, was that process easy for you or did you guys run into any uh, unexpected obstacles? You mean doing the podcast? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, well, we both, Leslie's had done quite a lot of like in front of camera and also interview stuff. And I have, you know, if you're in, grow up in academia or have an academic job, you lecture and teach. So talking and 
talking on your feet and having conversations, especially in my role now as a psychologist, is, is always comes fairly uh, well to both of us. So that wasn't a problem. The harder thing uh, is just learning how to um, structure conversations in a short amount of period of time, in a short period of time, but also stay on track and or bring people back on track as you will be undoubtedly trying to do for the next few minutes with me as I steer you off because I know all of the the tricks and the things that hosters hate so I'm just going to do them and see how you fucking do no sorry to see how you cope so um so no no I'm kidding so uh, but it's been it's been really fun and we've been we've had some fantastic guests to be honest and we come away learning and that's really been one of the one of the surprises that you you end up being smarter after every one and so we love that too so fantastic um, well, you did, instead of uh, steering us away, you just did the thing that every host loves and you walked straight into my next question, uh, <laughs> which is, um, I know, I know, I can tell that you, uh, I can tell that you, you knew, you knew where we were headed. I knew where you were going. Um, have you had a guest on the show that has changed the way that you thought about something previously? Uh, well, we've had actually quite a few. Uh, we've got actually one that we recorded this morning. We'll have on on in January. We won't tell you about what that is. Not that you know, there's a bit of a secret about that. But it's a great one. The one I will say, we had a guy called Brad Stolberg who wrote a fantastic book called The Passion Paradox, and uh, it really it's the sort of the subtitle, the paraphrasing of the subtitle is in sort of defense of an unbalanced lifestyle, and it's about the people who are most interesting in life, the people who actually like speaking to at dinner parties, if we ever had those anymore, or the people who are interesting or even just successful, they usually are all in on this one thing or two things that they love. And so this idea that we should be make sure that we don't over specialize, don't do too much of that, we have a lot of balance in our life, may not just be sort of unwise advice um, for, for being successful, but it also may be biologically impossible to achieve contentment and balance in life. And so, and what Brad talked a lot about was the different sorts of passion, which one of which is harmonious passion is when you do have a sort of there is a, an element of sort of healthy thinking around your all inness, and the other is obsessive passion, which is kind of a little, little bit like almost like subclinical addiction, right? That other things are suffering because of what you're going all in on. Relationships are suffering, and other whole host of other things. And knowing the difference between the two and how you stay on course of your harmonious, unbalanced life. And that I think for, especially for Leslie, because she's sort of one of these crazy all in people and unbalanced as I've met, um, is that it kind of gives you permission to say, you know what, I'm not crazy and this is okay to be like this. Uh, and I think that was kind of nice. It was good for us personally, both me and Leslie as, as a couple, but also it was kind of nice to hear that, okay, the advice that we give often is sometimes antithetical of what's actually needed to be really good at what you do. And so it's called the passion paradox. It was a it was a fab, and he's just a great guest. And uh, so it, yeah, it was a joy to have on. Has um has that concept then found its way into the work that you do with athletes, with patients? Is that ha have you found that showing up in your work? It has. Uh, if if nothing else, just to talk about it the way I just spoke, you know, that it's okay to be all in. And sometimes if you're in a non-endurance household, so in other words, it's only you that does it and you've got a, a spouse or someone who is sort of always complaining or moaning or something about it. And you know, there's a lot of, listen, let's not let's not beat around the bush. In selfishness and endurance sport go together like, I don't know, two Kardashians. So they, they are perfect bedfellows. And so um, managing that is a, is, a, is a challenge. And so often uh, people have come to me and have been asking, particularly if it's about sort of managing the competing demands of work and also I'm trying to train for Ironman and how do I do that and not piss people off along the way. And, and so there's some little nuggets in there that have really helped. So I, I get, and I always recommend that book. My, you know, doctors have prescriptions. I prescribe books usually or readings to give people instead of just like homework exercises. And that's one of my go-to books. And most people come away from it thinking other than, okay, I can start doing this, this, and this, or that I've got this person sort of having some oversight so I don't go off the rails. It's often just a sense of oh, relief that, okay, it's okay to be like this. And that in itself is really helpful to people's mood and mind. Are there markers or characteristics or actions that differentiate between obsessive and, um, and harmonious passions? Yeah, I should bring in my wife and I'll just point at it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this. <laughs> this. This. Um, 
Yeah, so, I mean, in general, when we talk about uh, uh, obsessive passion, uh, often it's about, you know, you're doing something at the expense of, not in addition to, all other things. So other, usually there's a sign that other aspects of your life are suffering. And critically, you don't know it, but other people do. And this is one of the, the, the real, and this lens, this is kind of a, a little insight into addiction in general, um, is that often the people around everyone knows it's like the worst kept secret, right? And you have convinced yourself that it's needed, important. And if you're competing for as a professional, which is one of the best ways to hide behind addiction, because of course, no one questions that you're training 30 hours or 40 hours a week. But if you're an age grouper and they'll be like, are you crazy? You're not doing this. So it's hard, it's easier to get away with sort of unhealthy behaviors. Um, but harmonious passion really is about, you know, finding something that you actually love. And one of the, one of the, I guess, the key pieces of this is you don't, the notion that we start, you know, you have to find your passion, which is a bit of a myth. It isn't hiding under a rock somewhere waiting for it to be discovered. Passion really is about the skill of noticing, right? It's about the, th and, and whenever you do sort of executive coaching or health coaching or coaching, even in sport, um, it's really about what you end up feeling that is that you're excited to get wake up for in the morning is already the breadcrumbs of that thing are already around you just you may not notice it yet you might have a a little you love to write at the weekends or embroider or read or something that usually those things are sort of are there already and so the skill of noticing is one of those things and so even just things like mindfulness training or journaling or asking people to reflect on things that have gone really well they love doing if you only had one thing take you know the three things to take to a desert island so you can find some of those things out and then you just sort of pick away at them and often people are not living harmoniously with that they've got this thing that they love to do but they're sort of either embarrassed or they don't want to take much time they're not really they, they perhaps they need permission to go all in on it uh, and that's been a, a really useful i think for some athletes especially that's been a useful sort of rule of thumb for us that is fascinating. <laughs> it's amazing. So what is something that you've learned um, from a guest that uh, that surprised you? So I think that we often interview people who we're interested in. Um, who's somebody who has really changed your mind? Uh, I guess, well, I, you know, we're in the endurance space. We all are. And we're talking to people who are in you know sports science or other areas. so and if you've got some level of either training or interest you've kind of it's hard to be truly surprised by stuff because you you may not know much about it but you know this is generally what is the you know the the, the kind of the, the rough area but when we started we had a woman called paula reed and she's an adventure psychologist i didn't even know there was such a thing an adventure psychologist uh, study the psychology just as we do in sport of adventurers and expeditioners and going into the unknown with being sort of prepared but you don't know what's going to coming coming up and and she talks a lot about things like the importance of going knowingly into the unknown and why that's good for mental and physical health and she has this list of 150 things 115 things that she wants to do like a bucket list and she actually has made one and she helps companies develop or employees in companies develop their own. And they don't have to be crazy stuff you know, that's financially impossible, but they might just be small things. Like one of hers was to streak at a public sports event. Uh, another one was to get arrested, you know, and she would talk intelligently about why this was and arrested in the sense that, and, and those two would probably combine, right? If you streak, you probably will get arrested. But, and, and so that was kind of interesting uh, to see why she did this and why it's important for mental health. And the other thing she talked about, I don't know if you've heard of this, I haven't. It's called the, 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 fun, the adventure scale or the fun scale. And the fun scale adventurers is apparently it's well known or talked about in adventuring and mountaineering and it's a scale of of how enjoyable things are and it goes from one to four and so I, i'm trying to remember this correctly so like a, a category one on the fun scale uh, is that it's um it's fun uh, while you're doing it and it's fun thinking about it afterwards right so everything is great right uh, type type two fun is when it's really quite miserable during it but afterwards you look back on it with delight so most of competitive sport like fits into this like it's painful it hurts and type three fun is when it's miserable during and it's miserable even when you think <laughs> about it, right? So, and so, and she was saying that, okay, most of our lives or most people spend their lives in type one when they talk about, you know, the general public, not us crazy endurance people, but 
about they spend their life in this comfort zone of type one. And it's good, it's really helpful for your brain and your physical body to do some type two stuff, miserable during suffering. We can talk about the role of, of, of suffering in human life and why it's actually critical for mental health. And then the, the, the third one, she says, we all need at least one or two examples of this in our lives where we can say, like, I hated it during and it's still miserable and I never want to do that again. And there's something to be gained from doing that. And so when you look at your life across those things, she's like, and her list, and she would look at, okay, these are type ones, these are type twos, these are type threes, and these are, you know, whatever, but I'm still going to do them because that's kind of important. There's a whole bunch of neurochemistry about why that kind of stuff is interesting. So the type, the fun scale, it was uh, like a bit of a, for me. And so I was thinking about all the activities I do now in those, in those, uh, in those settings. <laughs> Um, we will uh, we will get off the podcast at some point, but uh, one of the things we're we're so I mean we're so interested in other people who are also like creating something during this year. Um, but um, in one of the early episodes, uh, you talked about dealing with uncertainty, the, the mm. pluses and minuses of social media, and then how structure, r routine, and reward can help. Um, so that was back in April, like almost the before days, <laughs> yeah. um, like as this pandemic has stretched into a year, how have you continued to work on those subjects with the people you work with and kept that fresh? Yeah. So that's a great uh, question. So uncertainty is, has been shifting, right? So uncertainty to, to sort of, to go back to some, uh, uncertainty is when we don't know outcomes, right? We don't know what's going to happen. Uh, but there's, there's a few critical things when the outcomes are likely to be positive or at least sort of, sort of pleasurable, like Christmas is one of those under usual, so particularly for kids, right? I don't know what I'm going to get, but it's going to be good, right? I'm going to have an exciting time. And so uncertainty then is great for the human brain. We love, we love positive uncertainty. It's the, it's the sign when most of the outcomes are likely to be pretty shitty, right? Negative or bad. There might be some good things and so on. And so the difference and what we often try and do is we can't manage, we can't control uncertainty. And as I will say, even though the attempts to, to introduce certainty under conditional uncertainty helps, one of the more potent strategies is to hack a little part of our brain chemistry. So, so take an example of um, uh, scary movies or roller coasters or some things that some people love and some people hate. Well, they're all underpinning those as the same biological reaction, right? This stress reaction, fight or flight response, a whole host of neurotransmitters and hormones get released. And, and when you are under conditions of high adrenaline and cortisol and that sympathetic nervous system gas pedal is to the floor, some a, a roller coaster, a, a, a scary movie or something, some people love that, but other people don't, they hate it. And the difference is because the presence of dopamine. Dopamine changes scary to exciting, right? And so when you, and so this is a, a clue, if you want to try and find things that are uncertain and potentially miserable, how I can start to microdose myself with dopamine to make some of those things a bit more on, a bit more exciting. So psychologists often talk about reframing, about thinking of things, about, okay, that you could look at it that way, but what about if you look at it this way? It's a chance to build this skill. It's like we do with, with injury all the time, right? The world has ended. Oh my God, my season's over. It's fucked up, but it's a great time to actually re-engineer this part of your, your sport career or your, your, your biomechanics or whatever it happens to be. And you, your version 2.0 of yourself, after this is over, you're gonna be even better than you were. You're not just gonna come back to where you were. You're gonna be a new version of yourself, but, and it took this that dip or this down point for you to learn that lesson. And so when you start to encourage or foster this, it really helps. So unfortunately in COVID, right, there's, there's only so much microdosing <laughs> dopamine you can have when if you're going to lose your job, you don't know, you want to murder your own children uh, and uh, all the other things, you're, you're fighting over the kitchen table for Zoom calls and so on. Um, and we know, you know, the studies are already starting to come out about the, the, the effect, the toll that it's having uncertainty on our on our lives from, you know, we're working longer, actually, although we're not commuting, we're working longer, burnout and exhaustion is getting out of marriages are become relationships are becoming strained, relationships with children are becoming strained, and so on. So in general, we know that things aren't that great. Uh, so, so I guess the way that we in addition to trying to reframe it, we try and say, okay, routines, uh, uh, rewards and structure are going to help. And there's some really little things that you can do to make things 
quick, uh, better quite quickly outside of some little physiological hacks that we can do. But just like, for example, our mindset, how we feel and think is so inextricably connected to our context, the environment we're in subconsciously. So we are the way we think and feel through our perceptions and, and, and sensations from the physical environment we're in <clears throat> is a big driver of that. And if you've ever, we might have talked about this on when we spoke last, um, is that if you have cravings for bad shit, alcohol, drugs, or food or stuff, change your environment for a night or two nights. If, when you, if you go away, we can't do this now, but you, you know, you travel, you go away to a hotel, you stay at a friend's house. Some of these cravings suddenly miraculously don't like, like make you want to tear your hair out. You don't feel them as much. The environment matters. And we've learned this from the you know 50s when people had a hospital bed next to windows they had better outcomes they live longer the treatment they got discharged quicker there's something about a, a, a difference in your environment about to see a different environment so even just something as simple as changing the orientation of your chair or if you're on a turbo trainer you're now moving it in a, in a different orientation it might seem so ludicrous or so silly to do but little things like that have quite, can have quite profound shifts on how we think and feel about stuff. So structuring your environment uh, is really, really critical. And then the routine part is doing things at the same time, at the same day, and so on, to give us more of that uncertainty as possible. And having some rewards, that's the microdosing of dopamine, right? So there's a whole host of things, but people are now, they're tired and exhausted by the uncertainty, right? We're just, I'm just over it. I know all the things I should do. I want, I'm, just, I'm just over it. And so you kind of have to pivot now to thinking a little bit more about the future. Fortunately, the future is becoming a bit more certain because we have a vaccine. Stop me anytime. I'll, I'll, I love this. I'm finding this so fascinating. <laughs> Keep going. This kind of stuff. So, so as, as, for example, now people can actually think about races in the summer, which before we like, it could be, it may not. Well, what's the point of doing all this training if I can't? And all of the catastrophizing psych terms but or, uh, if everything's ruined i might as well do nothing now which is a tendency we all have for any behavior if we can't have it exactly the way we want it we do nothing at all and so on but now we can start to plan and strategize a bit more and so that is fairly critical the downside of course of this is that dopamine as a reward it drives us to persist and continue dopamine is also a kind of a pleasure neurotime it makes us feel good but the pathways for a reward that's a long way away versus here and now are quite different. They're in different parts of our brain. So this is why we'll always choose, or most of us will choose short-term rewards, even if they're lower or smaller over things that are in the distance or far away, right? I'll give you, I'll give you a hundred bucks tomorrow, or I'll give you 200 in a year's time. Most people take the hundred dollars tomorrow, even though you get double that in a year's time. The reward of, of thinking about rewards long-term are in our, go to our part of our brain that's more analytical versus the reward of here and now is more limbic system, professor uh, chimp brain, sort of, oh, I feel that, I feel good, right? So, and that's the, in, that relates to the, the sort of paternal, uh, or sorry, eternal challenge of exercise. We, when it's sold under, you'll live longer, you'll have a look better heart, you know, heart condition, metabolism. Well, that's all down the line, you know, five years off my life, uh, five years living, five years longer, when I've still got 50 to go, uh, I'll take them here and now of the half a pound of red vines in the cashew jar, but, you know, jar of cashew butter or whatever. So, yeah, so uncertainty is a, is a, a bit, and it's evolving. So, uh, but hopefully we are turning a corner. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, you know a lot of our a lot of our athletes right now are taking the Zwift race today or or yeah. the or the three Zwift races this week um, <laughs> versus the uh, you know the the race that may or may not happen next summer, which you know is yeah. totally is yeah. totally understandable. You need that, right? You've got to have some yeah you know, microdose dopamine. It's going to be much more rewarding if it's short term. So, you know, do it. And again, listen, we're born with three psychological needs. You know, you might have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of like security and mm -hmm. safety and all the other like physical needs, but 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 then we're also born with psychological needs. And literally we're born with them. We've studied we, we, the metaphorical we, the royal we, as we say in Britain, like the researchers, <laughs> uh, in toddlers and babies right through to adulthood. And these are competence, relatedness and autonomy. And all that means is competence. I want to feel successful and I'm, I'm good at stuff. I'm making progress. Autonomy is like making my own decisions. It's because I said so I'm not feeling controlled. 
and relatedness, right? Which is really one of the reasons why Zwift and Strava and is I'm having some human connection with others. I can give and receive love, affection, like encouragement as well. And that's a fundamental need. So of course, when you thwart that in psych terms, it, because it's innate need, it will just bump up, it will percolate up like, you know, whack-a-mole or mash the munchkins in Britain. It's, it will come <laughs> up eventually. And so when you provide opportunities to have that sense of, take Zwift is a great example, right? Competence, yeah, I can compete. Relatedness, great. Autonomy, I can race when I want. It hasn't got to be Sunday at eight o'clock. It's like check, check, check. Uh, it's innate psychological need porn. So it's fun. It, that's the why it's so successful. Right. We usually we usually end up with like three or four T-shirts, and innate <laughs> psychological porn is like definitely. <laughs> that's, yeah, well, that's... I should probably my, my psych professors are probably going to be like they ever heard they're like what are you saying? Yeah, I should probably <laughs> have a better metaphor or simile for that. But, uh, no, you've sorry. got your no. audience here. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> But I will say on that note, sorry, competence, relatedness, and autonomy, it predicts satisfaction in jobs, sport, relationships. And when people are pissed off or they or they just like, I don't know what I should do, make a decision, use these things as audit tools, right? Am I going to get this level of competence? Am I going to, is there a chance for me to grow in the company, to make my own decision, to move up? Is Am I working in a team? Am I going to be controlled? So, and when you find that what people get most frustrated and the relationships are work, you usually, it, it, one of the, one or more of those things are the culprits. They're just not being nurtured or developed enough, right? I just feel as though whatever I do, I'm a cog in a wheel. I never see the end product of what I'm contributing to. I don't know whether it's good or, you know, and that's where we start to get into a psychological toilet clog. Uh, and so trying to figure that out is really important. Speaking of psychological toilet clogs, um, I have a question about <laughs> social media. Yeah, um, yeah okay. So like a lot of our athletes and, and us um, ourselves, um, I've noticed that it's gotten so easy to compare how well everybody else seems like they're doing in this period, not only in general, but also like with athletics, like everyone else seems to be training, everyone else seems to be racing seems to be getting faster yep. and stronger and i think that like the zwift racing and accessibility of virtual racing and the lack of reality of all of this like sort of comes into a a, a terrible um toilet clog of uh, yeah. of satisfaction um do you have any recommendations for athletes in engaging with social media and like how to do that in a way that is health healthy <laughs> Yeah, there are there are a few. So the first thing is, again, this is the self-compassion piece of this, mm -hmm. is that no matter how much you try and no matter how much the self-help world will try to tell you, you know, comparison is the thief of joy and all this stuff, it's fucking nonsense. Your brain will smack you over the head until you do compare yourself. It's like it's human nature to know where you fit in any hierarchy, fitness, shagability, smarts you know you will want to do that the first in fact when you present anybody a human uh, a, a good functioning living human with a piece of novel information the first question is what does this mean right and, and in sport we could say that a new athlete and we're going to talk to my fdp and they get what's the okay what does this mean the second question is is that any good right <laughs> i am instantly i need to benchmark it to where i sit so your brain is wired and there's a good evolutionary reasons why it does that. And so we don't want ever want to get rid of that, but we have to use it sensibly. And unfortunately, and not unfortunately, the mother nature has endowed the human brain with what psychologists call impression management software, right? And impression management is simply that we are constantly, especially you, Chris, const <laughs> constantly, I know, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm just like heckling you now. And you know, the poor, you're not even saying anything. That's, that's unfair, that's below the belt. But our, 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 our brain is constantly trying to find ways, right, to figure out where I, where I sit and where I fit. And so it will always do it, whether you, whether you actually like it or not. So, so one thing about impression management is that you are, we are constantly trying to curate other people's perceptions of us, even Chris where trying to hide his mohawk with that hat on, right? Or he's got those big headphones. He looks like a pro podcaster. Uh, Chris, I'm just going for you today, mate. I'm do sorry. It. Do it. So, so it. we are constant. We are constant. We are we are constant. Like the fact that I've had to tidy my my little living room up before I come, so you're not seeing the you know the sex toys and all the other shit that's on my. So we constantly do this, and some of it is deliberate. We know we do this. You know, we we put on nice clothes when we go out at night or what have you. But a lot of it is subconscious, and and unfortunately. 
uh, uh, when you're in, when you're giving a, a, a sort of a, a media environment, like an, a, a virtual environment, particularly like Insta Instagram or, or, or TikTok or Facebook and so on, that we can, we have some say in what people see, right? We, when we go out, we don't, right? No, only, this is my good side. Only look here. Don't, don't go, go to that side, the sticky out here and the bulb patch. Don't look at that. But we can't, we can do, we can avoid all that on social media because we can take 10 selfies and only post the one that makes me look like popping cheekbones, right? And so we do this and then what people see, because again, their, their uh, hard wiring is where do I fit in all of this? Oh my God, look at them. They're, they're fit, they're lean, they're, they're whatever. They're, they've got a perfect family and the kids are great. Oh God, look at my sad, sorry life, right? And so some of it is, is we know we're doing it because we can see and we feel down, but a lot of it is very, very subtle. And in actual fact, some of, there's been a lot of research now, particularly on Facebook, is that the amount of perfection that you see is inversely related to the reality, right? So the more, the better it looks, usually the worse it is in real life. And, and this is fa a fairly documented phenomenon now in terms of how people choose pictures and uh, use touch-ups and all the other stuff now, Instagram filters and stuff. We do this all the time. So my advice is not to, and it's impractical to say, get off social media, forget it. We know your brain loves this. It, uh, I'll use porn for a second time without even referencing actual porn. Uh, social media is impression management pornography. It really is. It it sucks us in. It gives us that dopamine rush because we don't know what we're going to see. And then it fills us with your slipping down that ladder of shagability, fitness, attractive, whatever it is, constantly. And we come away, especially if you have more anxiety than other people, if you have lower self-esteem or lower self-confidence than other people, it affects those people disproportionately. So one of the things is really helpful to do, it might seem counterintuitive, is to be be a bit more vulnerable in social media. And I don't mean, you know, woo, uh, look at me or showing your, you know, your bingo wings uh, flapping because you haven't been doing it, going to the gym recently. It just means show some weaknesses or talk about things that you're struggling with. And most people rarely do this because they're waiting for the shit storm of like, oh, I told you. Uh, and the opposite actually happens. And coaches get, you may know this or you have found this, Chris, you know, when you were, and, and sorry, Molly, when you're coaching and if you're an athlete as well, there's a big pressure to perform as an athlete because I don't want to let my athletes see that I'm a shit athlete or I'm not as good as they, you know. And so you're, they're caught in this trap about imp having an impression management, my athletic identity, because it undermines myself as a coach. Um, and I've actually had a bunch of coaches who have had consults with me just about this issue. I'm trapped now that I want to do races where nobody knows me. I'm going to sneak off to a race in Montana and hopefully no one can find out who I am. I might even enter under a different name. I mean, the lengths people go to, right? And when you actually talk to your athletes about this and say, you know what, athletes in my Facebook Live or your little way that you communicate is to say, uh, and talk about that issue. I've got this race coming. I'm kind of nervous because I'm feeling I'm, I'm worried about letting you guys down. And I know, you know, and what you might, what what comes back is actually so, it ha gives you faith in this human spirit. It really does. You get nothing. Okay, you might have some a-hole, somebody who makes some heckle. Uh, but for the, mo the overwhelming majority is supportive and encouraging. And the, if there's one little take home lesson in psychology, uh, is that the, the relationships, trust in, and, and bonded relationships are built on, on vulnerability and weaknesses, not on strength. So we bond on vulnerability and weakness, not on strengths. This is why like team retreats or you go away and have to survive in the wilderness or you go, you see everyone's, you, you're down and dirty with everyone together. That's what creates bonds. So the more we can do that with one another and admit fallibility or vulnerability and you see what happens it's like oh my god it's a relief so do that a little bit more and then the other thing the other technique is to avoid being the stalker and the grazer and this is a term that's used in social media research which is so, uh, the stalker is the one that doesn't really post anything or contribute they just go on and look you know what's my ex up to oh that's their new partner oh i ain't ready you know they just kind of get in and that is a dangerous dangerous path uh, to plow as a mixed metaphor there dangerous field to plow uh, one of the reasons is because 
one, we're not contributing to anything. We're just sort of internalizing it and we're just seeing ourselves slip further and further down. And if you have a tendency to ruminate and worry, you're going to have poorer, um, usually poor mental health. But when you are part of a community and you start to interact, you get not just neurochemical changes in the brain, but you actually start to feel of that need for relatedness that comes back, right? You don't get much relatedness by just being a stalker and a grazer. So contribute, show vulnerability. And if you are in a position of leadership, authority or hierarchy, like a coach, a manager, or even more so, you have an even bigger responsibility to show that. The times that you've screwed up, the times where I was scared shitless, the times that that blah, blah, blah. And that's really, really powerful stuff. We often forget about it. This, um, go for it. I was just going to say, this is the most important episode of detention that we have ever aired. <laughs> <laughs> well, especially amazing. because, uh, you know, like a lot of times we're hoping that, uh, you know, like our athletes will be watching and now they're all just going to be like, yes, Chris and Molly are going to have to like, <laughs> I know, like, I know. Gonna have to, like <laughs> watch out. <laughs> Here we, here are all our failures, everyone. <laughs> well, you know, so one of the things about, you know, one of the works, I, one of the work, I, a lot of the work I do is in uh, like executive groups about teaching leadership and communication and giving hard to hear. How do you give hard to hear feedback? How do you criticize? Mm -hmm. And, uh, but in a nurturing way, and that might seem a, sort of a bit of a, you know, a paradox there, but there are some strategies to do that. And one of the one of the things obviously caring personally about people, right? You have to earn the right to criticize because if they don't think you care about, it, you just become the prickly asshole in work or whatever, the coach. And there's lots of coaches like Leslie's had a ton of those kind of coaches. Um, uh, but, I, but, I, but I do think, I, I was going with that, that stream of uh, uh, consciousness there. Um, so uh, yeah, having, having some sort of reflection about where you are is, is really kind of critical. Uh, and what I'm trying to thought. What? Well, see, I'm early onset dementia. What? What's happening? <laughs> um, uh, Molly and I were saying that uh, that this is going to be the episode that uh, makes us uh, uh, showcase. Oh, that's right. Yeah, the vulnerability often. parade. That's, <laughs> that's right. The vulnerability, right? Oh, yeah, that's right. So, get credit if you're gonna. You have to learn, and and we learn this by soliciting criticism. So, if you're gonna dish it out, you have to learn to take it first. And so one of the big techniques that we use for if you're in a position where you have to give people hard to hear, and it's not always in coaching environments, but certainly in managerial positions or direct report environments, like, first of all, show that you are willing to say, tell me how I'm screwing up. Tell me things that I can do to make your job so I can get out of the way to make your job easier. It doesn't have to be phrased in that way, but soliciting negative feedback and doing that as a part of who you are because what you're doing is you're modeling that process so when you dish it out and someone takes it they know that it isn't you know shit rolls downhill right and and we want to start making it roll up and downhill <laughs> and one of the ways to do that is to model that by asking for and it's hard to do right no one our egos no one likes saying end of year or every few months emailing an athletes okay it's my little 360 evaluation of me as a coach how could I be better? Because you have to hear some shit that is, is not nice, right? You just don't want to hear that information. Um, but it's very, very powerful. It's not just makes you a better coach, but it also shows that this person is willing to take it on the team. And it also softens it when you dish it out because you've shown that you can take it. Um, kind of going from, you know, from, from Molly's question about social media and, um, and, and we all have uh, probably some ordered or disordered thinking in that realm. Um, uh, but we'll all be fine now after your advice, um, uh, <laughs> shifting to, you know, so you've written, you know, you've written this, this whole book and done a lot of work with, uh, with athletes. Um, yes, that book, um, <laughs> one of, uh, one of the people in chat, uh, just posted a few minutes ago that he bought your book this afternoon. So, uh, oh. so um, I yeah, know, congratulations. Um, we, we won't, uh, we'll, we'll send you a fewer number of the cheers now. <laughs> uh, but um so what is this kind of um like i don't want to say error and error in thinking but yeah. what are some of the the errors in thinking in sport that you bump into maybe the most you mean errors in, errors in thinking about how athletes think about yeah like when yeah when they are when they are thinking about preparation or competition in ways that are unhelpful right, right. to their eventual performance 
So there's a couple actually. Well, there's there's the whole bunch, right? Whole bunch. Probably whole most bunch. of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so some of them are I di can be boiled down into. I thought it was only me that thought like this, right? And if there's one wish I could have on start lines world over is that as you walk, do the the walk to your death to the start line, and it feels like that you just about to go over the trenches, right? Um, that if you could see little bubbles appear in people's above people's heads, thought bubbles about what they're actually thinking, you would be not a lot. Well, you'd probably be alarmed, but you'd be <laughs> amazingly comforted. And and I've learned, I've I've been had the pri the privilege of having insight into that just simply because my job is having people open up in privacy to talk about their darkest fears. And one of the the main aha moments that I have that none of my training prepared me for is that it doesn't matter whether you're just about to go out and win the Tour de France, or you've qualified for Olympic final, or you're doing your first turkey trot, right? The sort of the mindset and the worries and the apprehensions are almost identical. The themes of them, right? Letting people down, looking an idiot, humiliated, embarrassed, and shown to be inadequate in front of other people, especially when other people around you are doing it better than you. These are enduring themes and we all have them, just some people are going faster during it, right, than others. And so you give people permission to say, you know what, the, did you know, and I give a few, in, in individual consults, I give a few little confidential sort of examples of that, about, did you know, and Leslie's a prime example of all in her book, she talks about this a lot, about all of the demons that she's had. And it's amazing, our own athlete, what you think about your concern, but, but, but you've done, no, it's the same. And so this is now kind of, it's the condition of the human brain, the human spirit is that we are wired to be like this, right? To have, and particularly around like negative, and it's usually framed around some aspect of negativity. And in, in brain world, negativity or negative thinking is like Velcro. Positive thinking is Teflon, right? We, as you or any kid knows from getting a, or any athlete knows, or anybody's got feedback, the 10 things that you did great and the one thing that you need to improve on, which is the thing that we, oh yeah, the nine things I can, that I did great, forget those. The one thing it's, it's Velcro. And the human brain is an evolutionary mechanism we need to have that way and the human brain is wired to avoid the consequences of mistakes now that seems and I'll, I'll say that again because this is a really critical thing for athletes to get their head around your brain is wired to avoid the consequences of mistake of mistakes your brain is not wired to correct flawed thinking to correct biases to correct like, you know, you should be thinking this, I ought to, no, the brain is, is it's about consequences. That's why we are negative because it forces us to, the one thing that could end my life or hurt me, I need to make sure that that doesn't happen again. All the other praise and the buzz. Now, when we're in the sort of relatively benign world of competing in sport and the negatives aren't life or death, we've still got a Velcro Teflon from our primordial past. It's, it makes for misery. It makes for misery. And so, there's a shift, and I pivot this to the answer to this question a little bit. There's a shift in psychotherapy and clinical psychology happening right now. And this is around how we start to help people who are overly concerned or overly ruminating or worried about not good enough, negative, things are going to turn out poorly. We've gone, we're going from a control model, which is you get a negative, we have to smash it down, replace it with positive. I'm strong, I know I can, I can't, I've got to win the fight to be happy, I've got to be positive. And, I, and we're moving away from that approach because one, we've never met anybody who's able to do it successfully. If anything is neuroscience has told us, you don't have that much control over your thinking. I can put a thought in your head right now. And I can tell you, I don't want you to have this. I want you to force yourself to reject this thought at all costs. And I can still put it there. I won't tell you how to do that. Uh, <laughs> or I, well, I could do, but they said it's a, a, a little psych trick that we do, but we, we don't have much control of our thoughts as we think of it. So they, they just keep popping up and we spent, we exhaust ourselves financially and emotionally trying to win the positive negative fight, the battle raging between the forces. So the, the shift is compassion and acceptance, right? And there's whole schools of psych, the one is called acceptance commitments therapy. And there's a, and it's saying, and we do this in our book, the underpinnings of our book really are acceptance commitment therapy is learn to 
jump hand in hand with your fear, right? Mm -hmm. Your fear, those demons are probably always going to be there. Sorry, it's just the way that we're built. It's a combination of genetics and upbringing and all these other things. And you've chosen to put yourself, force your shoehorn yourself into lycra. I guess what? It ain't pleasant um, for many of us. And so you're going to be on display. So we can't do much about that. But acceptance is let's see what happens when we jump hand in hand with all the things that scare us. And if you can take that first step and do it, you find, oh, my God, the world didn't end. People didn't ridicule me. People didn't laugh at me. And you slowly start to desensitize to it. And you like Leslie, you get addicted to that. You get addicted to putting yourselves in situations where all the odds are stacked against you. Right. Uh, she'll do like local races the day before. She'll try and deliberately do the hardest session she could do so she can the next day would be arrested. But she forces herself to race exhausted, fatigued, tired. And it's important because you have and Leslie locally, she has a target on her back whenever she turns out for a bike or run events. Right. I can beat Leslie Patterson. And the, the trick is not to then say, oh, yeah, I've just, I've just had a hard session. By the way, I'm fatigued. Is to not tell anybody about it. You take it like a woman, right? Like a man, you know, whatever. You take it <laughs> with. And that being able to do that well is a skill and you have to learn it. And this comes back to one of those other sort of big lessons is that when it comes to self-confidence or embracing the suck you can only earn it you can't learn it even our book yes even our book cannot turn you into a embrace the suffer embrace the suck suffering champ you have to get out there and suffer and that's actually how you get better at it but what are comfort zones right people are scared to show up and we know this as coaches every race in their heads becomes an a race i want to be i want to taper for every event not train through it. I want to like, if so-and-so is going to be there, I need to put on this show. No, we got to get out of that mindset. And, and that's a hard lesson to learn. But if you just do it once, it just, it's a huge step. So find something that's scary. And this is, I guess, a little bit tying into some of the stuff that Paula read in her bucket list. Find, some, find something that scares the crap out of you. That's probably not going to end your life if it doesn't go well. Uh, and do it anyway and see what happens. And the goal is not to pace or podium or win or see how you do just to say to the experience of how did it feel did, did my worst fears come 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 true and nine times 99 times out of 100 they don't and that's really one of the hallmarks that's one of the biggest lessons that we can teach like go hand in hand with it so i'm curious about um the relationship with this and and what you've been talking about and so i think as coaches we try to mitigate and control some of that uh that fear and anxiety with a properly executed plan and a plan that has like been created to make sure that athletes are you know within their within their means throughout the entire race to try to make sure that we avoid some of that like catastrophe but I think yep. that really well executed races tend to involve some amount of risk. Um, and I think yep. that in all of these situations, you're advocating for some amount of risk. Um, what is your view of the role of risk in, in endurance sports and in success and in like, you know, the, the successful races, I guess, successful endurance. Sports? Right. So, so seek it out, take it, do it, try it with the little, the little disclaimer at the bottom unless it's pain injury pain related unless it's stuff that is going to jeopardize you know relationships if you if you race one more time and uh, whatever you know you, we, we're trying to still balance uh um you know we've got we've all of us are plate spinners unless you're mate well even professional athletes are plate spinners we have to kind of be respectful of that so mm -hmm. the one thing if you do things as you know if you do the same thing over and over again you'll likely get the same result and breakthrough performances breakthrough sessions if there's one thing that characterizes them in addition to the stars aligned being the perfect day the conditions and the fitness it's the ability to take a risk don't be risk of don't be risk averse right tactically it could be risk uh, taking a risk and what, what however you want to think about what that means for you but take a risk and you and if you're going to blow metaphorically speaking do it spectacularly right and so see that as a lesson and again 
So and if, if you come away, think, well, I'm not going to do that again, right? That is a good lesson to learn. So take, so risk taking is one of these things. Again, this is what the jumping hand in hand with your fear is about. Doing that is a risk. I'm going to be humiliated, embarrassed, or shown to be inadequate. That's the site. That's what your chimp brain will shit the bed at if it thinks that you could be in one of those three circumstances. So we avoid those at all costs. Our chimp tries to talk us out of those situations. But if you can sort of override that or just numb it down a little bit and whatever form that takes, being anonymous or a race that no one knows you or racing on holiday, which on vacation, which is another great one. Oh, there's a local 10K. I'm in some weird town, I, but, right? Just show up and do it. They are breakthrough, they, they are potentially breakthrough, psychologically breakthrough experiences. So do them and take them. Um, one of the features of the book that we love so much, and um, I think this is because both Molly and I have like some educational background stuff, is the exercises that you included. Um, mm -hmm. I think one feature of like all the other mental skills books is that it's basically just somebody talking at you for you know 300 pages. And um, you had so many wonderful exercises in the book where you actually sit down with pen and paper and do something. Uh, I wonder, is there one of them that you find yourself gravitating to first that you find really, really powerful that you, uh, that you prioritize? Um, it, it really does. There are a couple actually, but it really does depend on what athletes are coming to you with. Right. So if one, one big category, one big bucket of like toilet clogging, uh, turds, if I, <laughs> I want a better word is imposter syndrome related, right? I'm not good enough. I don't think I can. What if, you know, I'm too slow, I'm too fat, I'm too whatever, the ifs and that. And so one of the, and, and, and often, you know, they are living with that mindset before they come to you and they're so used to that. Um, and the thought of being in years of years of psychotherapy or having reading all of these self-help books and in four years time after a thousand hours of tantric yoga and meditation, I'll finally have, well, I'm sorry, I ain't got time for that, right? So. What can you do that's quite immediate? And so the alter ego exercise that we have is one of the quickest and best ways to sort of, that you can literally do overnight and can change your life. I've used this personally when I started teaching as when I became a professor, um, I had to stand for the first time in front of 500 students and I'm introverted. You might not think that, but I'm, I'm fairly introverted by nature. And the thought of doing that and like, oh my God, I looked younger than most of them. And it was like, oh, this is my worst, like, you know, the karaoke dinner, th interactive dinner theater and standing in front of students of 500, I'm like, like no. Uh, so what I did is I pretend, I looked at lecturers or professors I had and I copied them and I pretended I was somebody else everything and the students didn't know anything but inside I might have been dying but on the face of it and that was a quite a remarkable shift you don't see any of there's not much evidence in the uh, evidence there's not much uh, help in the self-help world about this sort of strategy Leslie uh, found it as an athlete you know she's five foot two and a hundred pounds and she's up against these you know, women that are carved out of granite, you know, and they're just these perfect athletic specimens. And she's looking at, I'm going to get my fucking ass kicked. She has to have a persona that is bigger than her little umpa lumpa frame, right? And so she found that having this MMA thing about her was, was the way that she could transform herself. And psycho they use this technique in psychotherapy uh, all the time. Acting, that's what good acting is. You know, we can be moved by someone portraying a character and we forget that it's not really them. We believe it, we invest in it. And method acting is when you actually almost believe it yourself. And there's a, and the reason this works, there's a, there's a term in psychology called embodied cognition, but really what it's down to is that psychologists for years, the most basic model of all Self psychology or all like therapeutic psychology is thinking, it's a trick of that model. Thinking influences feelings, influences behavior, cognition, affect behavior. So that's why it's a trickle down. That's why most psychology starts with changing the way you think, because that will trickle down to feel better and you'll act more whatever. But we now know you can reverse engineer that process. You can act different and feelings and thinking changes as a consequence of it. And it isn't just dress up, make believe. 
neurochemical changes happen in the brain when you fake stuff. Even when you just smile. If you go through a race and you're miserable and everything is going wrong, if you start thanking every marshal you pass or everybody that passes you, instead of looking immediately looking at their calf and doing the calculation of whether I need to or how shit I am, you, you compliment, good job, keep looking strong. And yes, there's a great reason to just be a nice person you're doing that, but you're also doing it for your own brain chemistry, right? It really does work. And that we, the neuroscience now shows us this work. So fake it till you make it, right? Evidence-based science, fake it till you make it. So that's just one, the alter ego is probably one technique I'm a, I'm a huge, uh, huge fan of. Yeah, I love that one. That was that was one of the first ones I did, and uh, yeah, so just so helpful, you know. And just and you a, and you said that your alter ego was the the princess in Frozen, right? That's what yes, you told absolutely. Me. <laughs> okay, yes, just making um, sure. Of course, let it go. Yeah. Let it go. I mean, um, you know, I mean, like you just totally breached like patient, like client confidentiality. <laughs> there, I mean, that was no. I never listen. Was... I I never <laughs> mentioned the tiara and the blue dress. To be fair, oh. Yeah, I know. I mean, we're just going to keep going down this particular snowball. Uh, um, Quite literally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's wonderful. <laughs> so I want to know what you're like as an athlete. Um, do you put all of this into practice? Are you like yeah, the world? So, <laughs> you know? Yeah, so here, here's, here's, a funny, here's a funny thing about expertise, right? And, that, and again, I could talk about this from a scientific perspective experts are <laughs> shitty at being experting themselves right this is a phenomenon that's true usually like coaches are usually the worst unco most uncoachable athletes doctors make the worst patients psychologists have more issues than they you could you know and so there, there are actually now some scientific explanations of why that is but Aside from that, so I, yeah, I'm, I'm an athlete. I think I even got into sports science and psychology because I had the opposite problem of Leslie. Leslie's problem as a young athlete was uh, you don't on, you know, the talent ID stuff, you're all the lab data. Uh, no, you ain't, you haven't got what it takes. Uh, and she would outperform. Mine was the opposite. You should be better than, why are you so shit? Because you should be better. And I became fascinated by that sort of discrepancy. And so as an athlete, I, mean, I was a category one uh, cyclist, um, uh, got, went uh, kicking and screaming into triathlon because I married a triathlete and had to deal with my own chimp. At, talk about, you know, the, the accumulation embarrassment. They're gonna, I'm gonna come out of the water like, you know, so like a swim like a seahorse, you know, a, a foot a toe dragger, <laughs> heavy, heavy ass and heavy thighs. And I'm gonna come out last in the wave. And oh my God, this is the guy, this guy who we're trying to hunt, you know, my profession would be down the toilet. So of course, none of that happens. And I have to, so I deal with struggle. I've got the same ingredients, the same soup as you guys have in your head. So I struggle as well. But the difference is that when you help other people, your own chimp doesn't usually get involved. You're helping with professor. When you try and help yourself, you've got an 800 pound gorilla, or in this case, a chimp, that's five times quicker and five times stronger. So all of your own advice is really difficult to follow. And the number of times as Leslie's had to say to me, you know, a good, a good example of this, I was a professor of behavior change, somebody who helps people, researches and teaches how to change behavior. And I hated my job. And I was, and I would come home every day moaning about why I didn't like it, why I didn't like it. And Leslie would say, kind of swearing, Oh, yeah. That's why you're a yeah. fucking professor of behavior change and you can't do this. Like, really? Really? And that was a bit of a, a light bulb moment for me as well, is that, yes, you, we all have to get out of our own way. Um, I'll rationalize it, why that is. But yeah, so I'm a, I'm a decent athlete. I think I'm, I've got more physiological talent than I've got, like, motivation, drive, discipline, like the ability to embrace the suck, you know, uh, as uh, most others. So I struggle with all the same stuff as this. And that's why our book comes from the, the heart, not just the head, right? We, this stuff we wrote as a pet partnership, not because we just, you know, join a, you know, listen to Enya drum and say, I'm strong, I'm beautiful, I'm confident. It's because our, Leslie's career was depending on this. My professional career was, if this doesn't work, you don't get work again. And so it had to work. And so it really was a mashup of those combination of those two things. And so that's how we came to it. <laughs> um, let's see, uh, we're, we could, we could sit here all night. This is amazing. Um, and we've only scratched like, uh, like, 
maybe about a third of the questions we've got for you. So, <laughs> oh, um, sorry, we have to do it again. Don't, yeah, absolutely. Yes. That's my that's my way of seeding the <laughs> seeding the future one. But I, um, I haven't even got to the good stuff yet. I mean, I've got some. What? <laughs> some, uh, yeah. I have some serious two. fear of missing out. Uh, that's all right. That's all right. But, that's um, all right. Um, so earlier you, you brought up a uh, harmonious passion. What is your harmonious passion? Mine is, I'm sort of fairly, I, I talk about being introverted. We can talk about, you know, misnomers about what introvert, it, introvert extrovert is basically how your batteries are recharged, not, not what you situations you'd be enjoying. So where do you retreat to, to recharge? Mine are all fairly insular and like, I've got a strong intellectual curiosity. So I read and write a ton. I read a book a week. Uh, I, I had this goal of reading 52 books a year and I devote time. I set goals about it and why in the first thing in the morning, just like an athlete would uh, about training and strategies for doing that. And when and I'm in my happy place, when I'm learning stuff and, I, and even if there's no desire, and this is the heart that, that gets the crux of intrinsic motivation and pa pure passion. If no one ever heard, saw or knew about this, would you still do it? And I would, I could read about, you know, horsemanship uh, or equip, something that I've got not much interest in or not good at or, and get into it because I'm fascinated by learning new stuff. And so that's my passion. It's sort of just trying to learn, like discover, find stuff I didn't know and think about it. And that's what I do. It's probably why I'm a crappy athlete. Amazing, but, but, <laughs> an, but an absolutely amazing person to talk to. Yeah. Um, oh, that's very kind. Stellar yeah. interview. <laughs> <laughs> um, Simon, we 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 cannot thank you enough for coming on, uh, coming to detention, and uh, and dealing with our spitballs. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, we really really appreciate you coming to join us tonight. Well, listen. If this is what detention's like, I should have I should have smoked behind the bike sheds a long time ago because this was fun. It's always great to see you guys. Hopefully, it'll be in person next time over a beer in Portland. Ah, uh, yes, yes. We will definitely take you up on that. On you. Yeah, you got it. You go. We'll use our cheers. Um, that's right. That's right. <laughs> And everyone who's joined us tonight, thank you so much for engaging and being uh, being involved in chat. Don't forget to come back for Yoga with Amy VT tomorrow at 7.30 a.m. Um, we will be seeing you soon. And Simon, thank you again. This was just wonderful. My pleasure. Stay safe, wear a mask. Will do. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye.